welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. We have a special episode for you today to mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Global Dispatches has teamed up with the podcast Inside Geneva to bring you a live recording in which host Imogen Folks is joined by conflict resolution experts to discuss the prospects for peace and how it can be won. The guests include Katya Papagiani, Director of Policy and Mediation Support at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, Keith Krauss, Director of the Center on Conflict Development and Peacebuilding at the Graduate Institute Geneva, Hiba Kassas, Executive Director of the Principles for Peace Initiative, and Shafali Kaur Nandra, a graduate student in sustainable development at the Graduate Institute Geneva. In this conversation, the panelists address the key questions of what can bring this conflict to an end, and might there be a viable peace process on the horizon? Once you listen to this episode, be sure to subscribe to Inside Geneva wherever you find your podcasts. Inside Geneva is produced by Swiss Info, a public service media company based in Bern, Switzerland. Enjoy. This is Inside Geneva. I'm your host, Imogen Folks, and this is a Swiss Info production. In today's programme... A huge Russian military offensive by land, sea and air. The Russian President Vladimir Putin is calling this a, quote, special military operation to protect Donbass. That invasion is an affront to our collective conscience. It is a violation of the United Nations Charter and international law. There is a concept that floats around in in academia for many years called a hurting stalemate, when the two parties have decided that enough is enough. And we're clearly not at this hurting stalemate. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. I am forced to announce today that Russia is suspending its participation in the Strategic Offensive Arms Treaty. I don't know of any situation where a peace process has thrived in a hostile international climate or regional climate. You may manage to bring humanitarian assistance in the short term, alleviate the suffering in the short term. But without the structural conditions, your activity doesn't have cumulative impact. Peace is beyond the absence of violence. It's really around access to justice, it's about economic opportunities, it's about uh, security, accountable security, it's about pluralism. Sustainable peace needs to include the youth, it needs to inform the youth, and it needs to educate the youth. So information, inclusion and education. Hello and welcome again to Inside Geneva. I'm Imogen Folks, and we are here today at the Geneva Graduate Institute In, of course, Geneva, which, as a lot of you may know, is sometimes called the City of Peace. And that is going to be our topic today. Perhaps over-optimistic, I can hear many of you thinking that already. It is one year since Russia invaded Ukraine, a conflict some predicted would be over within days, a conflict which has had repercussions right around the world. We are going to bring Geneva's expertise to the discussion today by looking at how to make peace. It's probably not imminent in this conflict. Nevertheless, this city has a wealth of expertise in conflict resolution. So I'm delighted to welcome Keith Krauser. Some of the students here at the Graduate Institute will know him already, of course, director of the Institute's Centre on Conflict Development and Peace Building, Hiba Kassas. She is the Executive Director 
of a new initiative, actually, in Geneva, the Principles for Peace Initiative. Next to her, Katya Papajani. She is the Director of Policy and Mediation Support at Geneva's Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. Many of you may have heard from that of that. Some of you may not have heard of it at all because it tends to operate in a very discreet and diplomatic fashion, but nevertheless has succeeded in getting warring parties round the table. And finally, representing the students of the Graduate Institute, we have Shivali Kaur Nandra. She is a graduate student in sustainable development. To begin, I'm going to come to you first, Katya, because you actually also have experience in Russia. It's one year on. We've heard some saber rattling yesterday again from Vladimir Putin saying he's not interested in uh, nuclear arms control. He seems to be abandoning that. President Biden in Kiev saying Russia must be defeated. It's maybe a big ask, but what is your take? Where are we at this stage? Any chance of any discussion? Thank you, Imogen, and thank you for collecting us here. Doing this one year into the conflict is also very important. It's a sad moment, but also it's an important moment for us to think, is there a way of going to the peace table and, and of ending the conflict? This is a very difficult moment. All sides to the conflict and their supporters slash partners have difficulty actually speaking publicly and to a large extent also privately about getting to the table. Uh, it's very hard for actors to look beyond the horizon, beyond the military engagements that they're very actively engaged in right now. So a difficult moment for taking bold initiatives on the peace front. The difficulty with this particular conflict is also that we have unclear war aims by possibly both sides. In other conflicts, we at least the parties declare what their aims are, while in the case of Russia, it's very hard to decipher exactly what their goal is in this conflict, apart from the general statements of denazification and uh, eliminating the threats that Russia supposedly is facing. Um, on the Ukraine side, of course, the war aim is return to the 1991 borders. There is public support for the the Ukrainian goals, but everyone publicly acknowledges that they will probably need to be a different formula than that. I think everyone acknowledges some of the recipes around what will bring the conflict to an end. And that is first, that there will need to be obviously a Ukrainian state that is somehow viable, that can survive in the international system, in secure borders, and with a viable economic model. There is also an understanding that there will need to be a security architecture that accommodates both the status of Ukraine in Europe and, of course, the future of Russia in Europe. And so on, one can see that as a positive, that privately and publicly, people acknowledge that that will need to be those two issues of viability of the Ukrainian state and security guarantees. They will need to be part of the answer. Uh, positive side is that Regardless of the intensity of the conflict, like in every other conflict, there is always talks, often privately. And in the case of Ukraine, of course, we have had some engagement that has also been public. We had the grain agreement in July that, of course, didn't resolve the conflict. But it was an example of the parties being able to work together and their partners to be able to work together to get something done. That's important for both sides, but also for the global south and the general, the global economy. Um, and in addition to that, there are other issues that people are talking about. They're talking about the safety of Zaporizhia. They're talking about the exchange of prisoners. They're talking about access to humanitarian, for humanitarian aid, etc. So in my effort to not give a bleak picture of where we are, I would say it's a difficult moment to speak about comprehensive solutions. Uh, there is a sense of what a comprehensive solution might include. And in the meantime, there's a, um, a lot of activity trying to um, engage on other issues that might make the life of civilians uh, better and um, mitigate the consequences of this conflict. Thanks very much. Keith, let me bring you in because I, mean, I heard a Russian analyst, former Russian politician, now in exile, suggesting after listening to Putin's speech yesterday that he doesn't actually have an answer and he would privately want some negotiations. 
So I, I think I'm probably a little more pessimistic than, than <laughs> Katya. And the first thing we need to keep in mind is that the war did not start one year ago. It started long before that in, in 2014 when Crimea was invaded. So we already have a long experience uh, of diplomacy around trying to resolve uh, this conflict before it reached its more intense phase. So I think that we need to already see when you have a backdrop of, of eight or nine years of a simmering, not in fact frozen conflict, because there was always uh, confrontations and deaths, uh, that this is a, a hot phase, but we have to project ourselves into a medium, if not long-term uh, future. With respect to the goals, I think the lack of clarity is a, f a function of the battlefield um, because it was very clear at the beginning what the goal was and the goal was uh, regime change in Kiev. Um, and that was evident from the military incursions that occurred and the attempt to, to move on the city. So uh, to say that the goals may have changed is one thing, but the original goal was fairly clear. And I think that, you know, in the minds of at least some parts of the Russian administration, this idea that Ukraine needs to be kind of like Belarus uh, is fairly strongly held. And with respect to talks, the kinds of issues that are on the table that are being discussed are not ones that necessarily build to a longer term sustainable peace. They are important, though. I mean, you need a deal on uh, prisoners, you need a deal on grain, you need a deal on access, you need whatever you can get. But <clears throat> we shouldn't think that there's necessarily a cumulative dynamic that moves that forward very easily. And, and the people who are talking aren't always the ones who have influence. And that's very hard to discern on, on all sides at this point. So it's, I think, perhaps a, not as optimistic as somebody who's in the mediation world, but uh, uh, at least a, a healthy corrective on some of these things. Yeah, but let me ask you, Katya was quite optimistic. Keith, not quite so. The Grain Initiative or the Prisoner Exchange, they are not necessarily a path to a peace agreement, possibly confidence-building measures. <laughs> Well, where do I start? I think I'm going to share some of the pessimism of Keith and some of the, the hope of Katya in, in this. But I think it's, it's very important for me to start by saying what's happening in Ukraine is not only about Ukraine. This conflict and this horrific war has been sending shockwaves on energy prices, on food prices. And where we see the impact quite significant is in many countries around the world where that have been torn with conflict. We're at one of the most conflict-ridden moments in modern history. We have 50 active conflicts. We have affecting the lives of over 2 billion people around the world. And the reality is peace processes across the globe have not necessarily presented the kind of deliverables that people actually you know, expect in terms of their own aspirations of what, what peace would deliver. And what's happening with this fragmented international system that we're witnessing now with the, with the war in Ukraine, that the level of polarization that we're seeing globally is affecting even the perception of the West in many countries around the world. Because, you know, when we're talking about this is not the time to talk about peace, there is a, a big notion that almost the West is, has lost its innocence in its engagement around Ukraine and around the lack of hope and the pessimism around the need to talk about peace. Which brings me to the fact that if we're talking about peace in a very narrow sense, that peace is the absence of violence, maybe this is not the time to talk about peace in Ukraine, because there needs to be an end of hostilities and we need to reduce the prospects of future cyclical violence. But if we're having a conception of peace, which is what communities around the world, and we've been seeing this from our global consultations, and I can talk about a bit more about that later on, a conception of peace, that peace is beyond the absence of violence. It's really around issues of access to justice, it's about economic opportunities, it's about uh, security, accountable security, it's about pluralism, then it's, the story is very different because we can never say it's not time to talk about peace. Even Ukraine itself can start to lay the foundations for more accountable future, more accountable governance, and can lay the foundations for that in thinking internally in Ukraine around questions of pluralism, how the dignity of people will be respected across ethnicity, across religious divides. It's always time to talk about peace. And there are always things that can happen that ensure that communities have a big chance of seeing their rights protected, accountable governance. And Ukraine has some entry points to think about that internally as it prepares for the day after. Charlie, let me bring you in there because... You're the youngest. You're a student. I, I can't imagine what it must feel like. You're a student of sustainable development to wake up and find a really hot war this time last year. And yet here we have Hibba suggesting that even though we might not be close to any kind of negotiations, it's certainly the right time to think about what a peace 
might look like, what a sustainable peace might look like. When we heard about the invasion for the first time last year, it was incredibly alarming because don't forget we're in an academic environment at the institute here. So it's not like just hearing it on the news and then you feel slightly detached from it. You're surrounded by experts and professionals who have dedicated their lives to researching this and talking about it. So it was incredibly intense. I think it still is. But in terms of sustainable peace, I totally agree with Heba. I think what we need is positive peace. And that is to look at the institutions, to look at the attitudes and the infrastructure where these challenges are actually stemming from. So we're talking about systemic change. That's what will lead to a sustainable peace. Uh, It's not just the absence of conflict moving forwards. It's looking at the issues that have caused conflict in the past to ensure that or prevent to the best of our abilities, war and conflict and tension from happening again. From a youth perspective, sustainable peace needs to include the youth. It needs to inform the youth and it needs to educate the youth. So information, inclusion and education. By that, I mean, in terms of information, we're in a crisis of misinformation at the moment surrounding the war, um, specifically from Russia. But I'm not going to suggest that other areas of media are necessarily telling us the full story. Then in terms of inclusivity, the youth are really on the front line in many ways in this conflict. They're on the front line in terms of fighting. They're on the front line in terms of humanitarian aid and volunteering and leading organizations locally and nationally to help refugees. So it's really important that their voices are heard at the table, if we reach a table. And finally, education. This war has has disrupted education. Children and university students who have had to flee Ukraine, they are not necessarily in a situation now where they can continue learning and continue their education. That is going to affect them for many years to come and will then affect economies and work prospects and everything we associate with, for example, the sustainable development goals. So I really think it comes down to those three things, inclusion, information and education to move towards sustainable peace. So that's really interesting because you brought me very neatly to the next round of questions I had, which is broadening the discussion out a bit. And that is, you know, pitfalls and good examples for what promotes conflict resolution and maybe reaches a peace agreement. And I am going to be the the pessimist here because I started my career in the war in Yugoslavia and I don't see that that is necessarily a sustainable peace. It's not very comfortable. I've also been to the, the frozen conflict between Georgia and Russia and I have reported on God knows how many Syria rounds which have not achieved anything. So, but I have with me all of these conflict negotiators. So, Katya and then Keith, give me an example of a peace agreement that is a success and why, and maybe one that failed and why. What are the, the warning signs? Before I answer that question, which feels a little bit like not a trap, but it might, <laughs> might put us in a path for a very um, difficult conversation, I should say that my feeling is that what we have learned the past 30 years may not always be applicable for what we have ahead of us. And so uh, we may be gearing towards conflict resolution realities of the Cold War. And we're all hoping that this will not be proven right and that we will have a different international system a year, two years, 10 years from now than what we experienced in the 70s and 80s. However, the current trajectory, and maybe I'm going to be now the pessimist, (laughs) it was wonderful to be the optimist without realizing that I was in the first round, the realities of increased geopolitical competition. The fact that we're talking about the possibility of use of nuclear weapons, the fact that we're talking about the possibility of US and the United States and China possibly going to war over something, that something is Taiwan, but anything is frightening. The fact that you see a lot of geopolitical competition in Africa between the Russians, the Chinese and the West as an amorphous accumulation of actors, all of those things point to a, a different conflict resolution landscape. So my feeling is that we already have the category of conflicts that still fit the category of the post-Cold War, end of history, liberalism and liberal peace uh, as a model governing our efforts. So, And those conflicts will be the conflicts that are outside the geopolitical competition. So you may be able still to achieve significant liberal peace uh, type of outcomes in places like Senegal, 
Thailand, maybe Indonesia, Mozambique, that still remain outside the geopolitical competition. Even there, there is lots of pitfalls because of you, and you brought the Bosnia example. But then when you are in the middle of it, Ukraine, Syria, Libya, it's a completely different ballgame. And there it's about global powers agreeing on what the solution would be. And that agreement is absent and has been absent on the conflicts after the Arab Spring for a decade now. And I don't have optimism that it will suddenly appear, especially with Ukraine happening. So what works? If you look at Bosnia, the half glass full is no one has died for almost 30 years. The glass half empty is that, of course, people still don't cross the Moster Bridge and uh, the segregation is incredible and yeah, the they frozen don't trust is each other at all. Exactly. Um, and that was the best we could accomplish. Uh, none of it is perfect. So instead of answering your question directly, I would invite us to think about what kind of international landscape we're entering. And within that, what is possible? Because peace processes and mediation and negotiation is the art of the possible. Unfortunately, not the art of the aspiration. Keith? Now she's the pessimist. That's <laughs> yeah. very clear. Um, I, yeah, I would say if we reflect on this period uh, just a little bit, that the language that governed the Cold War architecture around peace was conflict management. And the term was very deliberate. You, you know, re resolving a conflict was possibly something you could imagine, but management was all we were striving for. And, and the word peace was not in the equation, certainly not peace building. So we need to think about the arc of history here. Uh, geopolitics did not disappear. We had a, a significant number of major conflicts that involved uh, the, the superpowers, the great powers, but they receded into the background. And a good example of, of its resurgence is, of course, the, the Sahel and, and, and Mali, which is a region that, you know, Mali actually went through a democratization Central process. Central African Republic uh, also. And, yeah. and other countries in that region where, where there was a great deal of optimism and a significant amount of investment, some, some democratic transitions, and it was partly local factors, power <laughs> dynamics, and partly global factors, power dynamics, that undermined those sort of fragile roots. So we can't say, well, we were out of an era of geopolitics and we're now back in one. We were, we were always in some mix. Um, but I also am, am concerned about these, the sort of international peace architecture. The space in which they can operate is, is so much smaller, and the conflicts that are outside of that the ones you point to are, are so much larger. There are, there are, of course, some success stories, right? I mean, I think the Colombian process, we have a lot to learn from that, not just because it was locally driven, some sort of external support, but really not a, an international uh, process. And we learn also how long and painful that has been uh, and how imperfect and incomplete it is. And there are a couple of others that, that, that you also mentioned. What I would point to is the absence of the software side of peace building in many cases around such things as, as reconciliation, which has been a hallmark of some particular processes and, and Hiba knows these very well, that goes well beyond the nuts and bolts of mechanical agreements and some peace agreements, territorial accords, security guarantees towards some genuine shift in the way in which groups regard each other, both internally and, and across borders. And that's actually... I think one of your strong points, uh, you framed it in terms of youth and, uh, and inclusion and information and education, but it's also bigger than that. It's about like, how do groups relate to each other? And it's not just the Ukrainian refugees that are losing their educational opportunities. But when I see some of the videos about what's happening in Russian schools in terms of training, let's call it propaganda, because I think that works selling out. Well, certainly, war. certainly selling yes. the war, right? Mobilizing for the war. These leave long-term <laughs> traces and it's very difficult to unravel that in any of these contexts. Hey, but I want to bring you in because Prince for peace, you've actually done a lot of research, surveyed people about what they think would make a good peace. I mean, what we're hearing around the table is that most peace agreements are very imperfect. Well, thank you, Imogen. And I think, you know, I, I want to start first by saying the Principles for Peace initiative, it's a coalition of actors across the political, diplomatic and, and peace building uh, and peacemaking space. And we came together out of concern for very same reasons that uh, Katya said about the changes in the peace and conflict landscape and, and how that is impacting um, um, the prospects of peace, but also out of a sense of fed upness, if I may. I know it's not an English word, but I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> fed upness for two reasons. One is that there seems to be some kind of inertia about that peacemaking approaches have reached an impasse from which they can't improve. And that's a fundamental flaw, because if we actually think about our collective track record internationally, 
even in the past 30 years, we haven't been doing very well. Peace processes fail after seven years and we see conflict recurring two or three times. So I think the bar needs to kind of be slightly or significantly different and we need to really recalibrate our approach. So we came together out of this realization that we also need to dig deep to understand why is peace breaking down? Where is that gap between the aspirations of communities and what our system and our toolbox is dictating to be how we are supposed to build peace and what comes first? But also to try and come up with a set of principles that regulate that wild west of peacemaking. Because, you know, on the war, you have the Geneva Conventions, which provide some frame of reference that can you can call out bad behavior, even though they get violated. The same on the humanitarian principles, but for peacemaking, what's intolerable? It's very subjective and different people have different understandings. So we went to, to try and understand that. And what we found out, that often peace breaks down for three reasons. One, because of a significant legitimacy deficit. Second is because of an inclusion deficit, because they're very exclusive affairs. And the third, because they're predominantly focused on the quick fixes. You know, band-aids don't heal wounds. We think that the quick fix would do it. And you've talked about Bosnia. And, you know, we were in Bosnia earlier in, in a consultation with a cross-section of society. And yes, it's true. If you're looking at the success of, of the peace process in terms of, that, you know, the absence of violence, it's a very successful process. But many also assess it as have frozen the conflict, entrenched ethnic divisions, and locked the country without continuing that phase. So I think what's really important is to recognize that if we are to move towards more sustainable peace, we need to address the structural drivers of conflict. And often populations tell, tell us their definition of peace is not always political peace. It's not always political transition. It's not always the elections as the first priority. It's important, but they also put very significant prime on the tangible benefits to, to communities. It's the economic, the social, the justice, the rights, the pluralism. It's to what degree their dignity is preserved and advanced, to what degree the process is also done and mediators are approaching peace processes with humility, that they're not dictating, that they're not architects of peace processes, they're midwives. So to go back to Katia's point, she's absolutely right. The liberal peace model as a model is actually being confronted. And we need to be ready to say, how do we recalibrate how we think about peace, how we approach peace, and how we actually consolidate it? And that means that we have really to do things differently. And doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results is the definition of, of insanity. So maybe we need to try something new. Chef, let me ask you, again, I don't keep pegging you into the, the younger generation, but we're hearing a lot about why things fail. I mean, do you feel inspired with confidence? With today's diplomats? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's very difficult to give up because if we don't feel optimistic, where do we go? There is no hope, uh, to, not to sound dramatic, but if we don't maintain any sort of ounce of confidence or optimism, then we can't move forward. It's as simple as that. Um, I totally agree with what my colleagues have said so far. And I think what Hiba was just talking about was the idea of a more holistic perspective on peace as well. Uh, as you were saying, that it's not necessarily always looked at in a political sense. I think that aspect of it can become quite daunting, especially when younger generations, if we're talking uh, from that perspective, are not as engaged with media, as engaged with the conflict. As soon as we politicize everything to the 10th degree, that becomes incredibly difficult to pull back and actually look at the individuals involved, to look at those children and those young adults who are forced into conscription when they don't necessarily know where they're even going to fight with the Russians, where they are just dropped in Ukraine and told to kill. And whilst it is important to keep this war politicized, because that's exactly what it is, I do agree that if we're looking at a sustainable peace, we have to really dig deeper than that. And that's where I think the optimism can uh, grow through, because when we start to dig deeper and we look beyond the political, as Hiba was saying, we start to realize that there are a lot of aspects in Ukraine, in Russia and globally, because as we know, it's had such a ripple effect on the world. There are many aspects that need attention, that need fixing or at least need imp improving, whether it's uh, economic, social, environmental, all of these things are interconnected. And so I do feel optimistic still, despite, <laughs> despite the pessimism that's been, that's been shared, because I don't think we have a choice.
Can you not come in quickly? I would love to hear from the participants here also where you all stand on climate change and all that our field can be doing related to the consequences of climate change conflict settings. Uh, so there is, in terms of engagement, there is a lot of areas where the, you can still be effective. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine is not the definition of what's happening in the conflict resolution field and what's possible today. There is a lot of important and useful work that can be done. Good. Well, that could be another podcast as well, <laughs> couldn't it? Keith, you wanted to come in there. So a couple of things. There, there is a concept that floats around in, in academia for many years called a hurting stalemate. It's a little fuzzy um, because you usually only identify it in retrospect when the two parties have decided that enough is enough. And that's a fairly simple version of it. And we're clearly not at this hurting stalemate uh, in, in any means. I think uh, I'm very uncomfortable with, with the word compromise. First off, the agency of the victims and the agency of the aggressors are not the same. Uh, and we need to be very careful about that. And secondly, because well, I use the word agency deliberately, because everything we know from peace processes is it has to be the local uh, actors. And I don't just mean the political elites who accept uh, and support and buy into and embrace any kind of settlement. Uh, so we can have a discussion about drawing lines, possible configurations of territory, but at the end of the day, they have to be acceptable to the populations in one way or another, because otherwise they're the seeds of, of recurring conflict. I do think that it's going to be long, um, and I always thought it was going to be longer than people expected. I'm not sure that simple additions of numbers of soldiers on both sides and numbers of tanks and uh, particular things will tell you much about how the this will actually turn out on, on the battlefield. Hey, but do you have any, any predictions where this might go? You know, I'm, I'm not going to predict because I think I'll, I'll be very, very pessimistic, especially as, uh, you know, as someone who grew up in a conflict situation and, and under occupation, you know, 70 years of occupation or so in, in my country. But I think what I, what I want to say is about reconciliation. You know, as someone who grew up in conflict, My concern is not only about the battlefield, but about all the insidious impacts that come after the guns have silenced. My concern and what I want to always put center are these insidious impacts. Because, you know, I've seen firsthand how lives are get lost, livelihood opportunities disappear, economies crumble, jobs go, you know, uh, critical infrastructures are destroyed. The social fabric of society becomes completely strained, that you really need to think seriously about how to rebuild the social capital. And I think Ukraine is not going to be far from this reality because there will be frustration if there is no active preparation of how even to reconfigure the state-society relationship after the guns have silenced. Because there were issues around governance and around the perception of, you know, the, the question of accountable governance and corruption. How do you reconfigure state society relationships where you have a pluralist system, institutions that preserve the dignity of all? How do you actually support this reconstruction uh, process? And I think in a way that lays a foundation for sustainable societal peace. So if we just even move from thinking about peace between the Russians and the Ukrainians for a moment and think about societal peace. And I think also the Russians have to be concerned about what's happening, what will happen in their territory and their turf as a result as a result of this. And of course these things differ between different societies who are open or not open to have this conversations. But really thinking beyond the battlefield is really important. Katya, yes, I see you're nodding, you've got your hand up. I mean, what Hip has said there, all of the things, the consequences of war, she's laid them out there in Geneva. We, you know, we talk about these things all the time. You have to ask yourself, why is it people keep on doing it? We know what these consequences are. Oof, Imogen. <laughs> you have asked a question that, as a Greek, I have to say, has been asked since my ancestors, <laughs> Thucydides and his uh, friends in the Athenian bazaars. Um, but... I think currently we are in very obviously in a situation of the international system being restructured. New powers are emerging and they're challenging the existing state of affairs. And uh, for better or for worse, humans have this competitive lack of a more sophisticated word um, of uh, relating to each other and organizing their societies. Um, so how do we actually get to the table and how do we actually get to the situation of, of having a meaningful conversation about peace? I think the first condition is a nurturing in the national climate. And right now we don't have that. I don't know of any situation 
where a peace process has thrived in a hostile international climate or regional climate. This is just the most minimal condition. And then, only if you have that, you don't have uh, actors spoiling your peace efforts. You don't have actors actively funding military engagements and funding all the activities that spoil peace efforts, only then you can actually aspire for something better, right? It doesn't mean you're, you're engaging in activities that most likely will not have a cumulative impact. You're having an impact in the short term. You may manage to bring humanitarian assistance in the short term, alleviate the suffering in the short term. But without the structural conditions, your activity in most of the situations doesn't have cumulative impact. Related, I hope, and sorry I'm speaking so long, um, I think the war in Ukraine will have an impact on, on what is the we. We constantly mm -hmm. keep using we. There is no we. And so what power does the we, the way we interpret, have on the ground, realistically? And what are our realistic ambitions so that we can actually achieve something concrete for the people we're working with? And we actually have to, we will need to proselytize others to come to our camp, to say that the vision that Hiba is uh, discussing with us today is worth pursuing. We cannot assume that they agree with it anymore, unfortunately. I'm not saying it will be easy. But. That's a question for you, Chef, because I think that's really interesting what you said, that we need to get this, this message of, you know, like, peace is a good thing. But some of the leaders also in Western democracies are not really saying it. They're not leading. Does that, does that concern you? It, it is concerning. And I think from what I've heard in, in our recent discussion here is that it's complex, right? Uh, fundamentally. And we're not in a time anymore where, you know, we have to be very careful with Cold War rhetorics. First of all, I, we use Cold War rhetoric a lot and have been using it a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not in an international political arena where Cold War tactics are at play in their entirety. We see this, you know, nuclear threat, mutually assured destruction. These terms are lingering, but the geopolitical field is way more complex now. I mean, Keith was saying that we've never moved out of geopolitics, but it is fundamentally different now than it was. Um, you can't even compare it to the Cold War anymore. And it's we can't even look at the, you know, the Bosnian War, the Dayton Agreement, for example, they used the lockup and step-by-step -step method to come to that agreement. Again, it's not that simple anymore because no one wants to come to the table to talk. And who knows what it was, you know, deep inside that caused those actors to actually say, okay, let's sit at the table and talk. But we're hearing clashing opinions from Western leaders, uh, as you just mentioned as well. And that's, I think, what's concerning because we have, you know, Rishi Sunak, British Prime Minister, saying... Uh, it's time to double down, give Ukraine all of the military weapons they need. We have Macron saying Russia needs to be defeated, but not crushed. We have President Biden saying this is going to affect generations to come because that's not obvious. <laughs> I mean, of course it is. Um, and so it's a bit concerning because we don't really have anyone saying here's our plan. Let's let's do things together. I know it's complicated. It's not as easy as everyone sitting down finding a strategy and moving forwards with it. But if allies are not talking from the same page, then how can we hope to move forwards? On that note, we are really almost at the end. I've got one almost quick fire question for each of you. I know none of you wants to predict where we're going to be in a year's time. I, I think it would be absolutely foolish to even attempt it. So I'm not going to ask you. You'll be relieved. Um, what I would like each of you to do looking ahead is give one thing that worries you about this conflict and one thing that you think that could be a route that makes me feel a bit more positive. Okay, so one positive thing. Ukraine was undergoing a, a really significant social and uh, to some extent political transformation. It was slow, it was painful, it was imperfect. Uh, but uh, at the root of that was uh, a much more robust civil society engagement. So I'm going to flip the narrative because I actually think that civil society is at the heart of this, not so much the international climate. And that trajectory could have been interrupted and it was by the war, but, but it was moving in a certain direction that I think was 
broadly positive. And that's what I think is really important, that we focus on the social dynamics that make possible stable state society relations, stable relations between groups within society uh, and between groups across borders. Um, and that's where I would put my optimism. The pessimism is that there are losers from this. There are a lot of powerful people, let's just call them authoritarians or autocrats or anti-democrats, who we've seen in many countries around the world. This is not just unique to Russia. Um, and they have their hands on the levers of power. Sometimes, like in Brazil, it gets slightly rolled back. Other times, such as in India, we're on a rather descendant phase. But we need to fight that struggle on, on those fronts as well. Katya, quick. Positive and worry. My worry, my worst fear is that we are going to go back to walls being erected. What's erected. the word? Erected. Well, erected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Erected in Europe. Another iron curtain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I somehow my instinct tells me we're not going to get there, but that's my, my biggest fear because I grew up with that. And my hope, I think, is similar to Keith. You see an incredibly vibrant civil society in Ukraine. So this has to be an asset for the future of the country. Hiba. What I'm hopeful about is that. In the response also to the Ukraine crisis, there has been also common values that actually transcended this fragmentation of the international system. And I think the Europeans came together very closely to stand in the corner of Ukraine. And I, what I hope is that there would be an opportunity out of the recognition of what came out from this and what's happening in this war, that we can have a global dialogue to reunite around common values, because the world is not going to be the same after this war. And I think we will have a lot more fragmentation and division so we have to work and we have to fight cynicism around peace, because if we don't, then actually we owe it to the two billion people around the world whose lives are shaped by conflict. So we have to keep at it. Shivali, last word. Many concerns, but one of my main ones is that this paradoxical rhetoric we have between peace talks and nuclear warfare now, because it's in incredibly extreme. And that rhetoric is not allowing us to see how we will build back globally when this does finally end, I say when, to remain optimistic rather than saying if. And my positive point to take away, I think the local and individual support we've seen around Europe and the world uh, for Ukraine, and also Ukraine's resilience and perseverance, Zelensky's leadership is incredibly inspiring. I think that perseverance will keep them going for at least the short term. I think that resilience will hopefully mark itself in history as something to look back on in times of hardship. Well, that is a positive note to end on. We all need good examples to look back on, shining examples from history. That brings us to the end of this edition of Inside Geneva. Thanks, Keith, Shivali, Katya and Hibba to the Graduate Institute in Geneva for hosting us. To all of our audience, Keith, you said slow, painful, imperfect. I guess that's our world. But let's hope that this time next year we are discussing things in a bit more of a hopeful way. Thank you all very much. A reminder, you've been listening to Inside Geneva, a Swiss Info production. You can email us on insidegeneva at swissinfo.ch and subscribe to us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our previous episodes, how the International Red Cross unites prisoners of war with their families, or why survivors of human rights violations turn to the UN in Geneva for justice. I'm Imogen Folks. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.